Jeremy, do you like to go by Jermaine or JD? JD. It's either whatever you want to call it. Okay. Whatever feels comfortable. I remember a conversation that I had with Babyface. I was cocky. I was young. And I thought, you know, I, I had made it. I thought nobody could do anything to me because I had crisscrossed and they had a number one record. And I talked to Babyface. It was the first time I met Babyface. He said, oh, you the guys with the little crisscross record. And I'm like, why is he saying that? Like, little. And I kind of took offense to that. And Babyface was like, you know, Jermaine, it's cool that you did that one time, but how many times can you do that? And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, how many times can you actually do what you did with Crisscross? Because that's the hardest part. To try to go in a room and create magic every day is extremely hard. I gotta create something different every time I go in that room. I think me being different than what was happening in New York, which was the most penetrated city, the fact that it was somebody from the South, when you look at the industry now, compared to how it was, I feel like what made me stand out was the fact that I was 20 years ahead of the industry becoming all young people. When I did Jump, I think I went into the Guinness Book of World Records as the youngest producer to ever have a number one record, right? That could never exist now because everybody's young and everybody's, you know, but at the time, the music industry had never seen a 18 year old producer with a number one record. So to me, genius is just focus, paying attention to something that doesn't exist and locking in on it and, and making people realize that it didn't exist. The setting is just like being in Atlanta and knowing that I had to do something different in order to stand out and then the imagination of not having anything and creating based on just, just your imagination. You'll try anything when you plan with your imagination. It's very competitive and ruthless, right? Yes. Can you talk about that? I think with me being in Atlanta, it kept me out of the competitive race of like chasing artists that other people was chasing and running into things where somebody else might be trying to do the exact same thing. I think Atlanta, me being here in Atlanta, it separated me from having to deal with a lot of that. Entertainment world was not something that was like prominent like it is in Atlanta now. I was kind of born in a music house hole, I guess. My father was, you know, a struggling musician at the time. <laughs> and then when he got to Atlanta, my father became like a roadie for like groups that was in the city already, like Peebo Bryson, SOS Band, Brick, and any, any other things that was happening in the city, my father was like more or less like a production manager, road, roadie type of guy. Throughout my whole childhood, he was a production guy. It's interesting that people get this story kind of twisted because, you know, my father basically was my manager as I started trying to be in the industry. And once I got the idea that I was wanted to become a producer, I went to my father and told him that I had a group, Silk Times Leather. And I wanted him to manage them. So basically, I, I put together this girl group and he was gonna be the manager. So it was like the beginning of our process of like the one-two punch of me doing the music and coming with the group and then him taking the management role and dealing with that. So that was basically, we basically both got into like the, the industry, industry basically at the same time. I saw the space out there where things were missing. And I think that's what I did. I just was like really like paying attention to what wasn't in the marketplace. And I think throughout my search of like trying to produce, you try to find that group. You're looking for that group because you know that, that that's going to be the one that, that turns your whole career around. 
Criss Cross was discovered at Greenbrier Mall. One of the girls from Silk Times Leather was with me, DJ Dolomix. They was in Jet Magazine. They might have been on the cover. So when we went to the mall, Chris and Chris was shopping at the mall, and Chris Kelly's mom noticed the DJ from the magazine. And I noticed the Chris's. They was walking through the mall, and people were paying attention to them. And I and I was like, why don't I know who this who these kids are? I thought at the time I'm like, this must be like, they must be like some Nickelodeon group or a Disney group that like I ain't pay attention to that station or those stations at the time, so I, that's why I didn't know who they were. And so, but I kept watching. I just kept watching to try to figure it out. And then all of a sudden, I, I just was like, you know what? Let me go ask these kids who they are. So <laughs> I went up to them and I'm like, what do y'all do? And they was like, we don't do nothing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what do you mean you don't do nothing? And it's like, we don't do nothing. We just kick it. We cool. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, y'all ain't got no TV show or nothing like that? They was like, nah. So everything that I was saying to them, they acted like it was all whack. Like I said, TV show, they, they frowned up like a TV show. Like, <laughs> I was asking them, they rap. They was like, rap? They actually even said, like to me, if I asked them if they rap, they was like, rap? Like, almost like rapping was whack. So at that point, my mind was blown because, you know, these kids was 11, 12 years old at this time. And I thought I was super cool as a kid, but these kids was like next level JD. And I think that's all I could think about is that like, th this is the next level of me. I gotta figure out something to do with these kids. Like I found them, I found it, I found it. You know, that's all I was going through my mind. I found it, I found it, I found it. So I was looking for them. I didn't know I was looking for them, but I was definitely looking for them. guy named Ian Burt that basically kind of, I want to say, was in the birth of every artist in the early 90s uh, coming from Atlanta, uh, whether it be Dallas Austin or TLC or Escape, The Goody Mob, Outkast, Organized Noise, Arrested Development. Ian Burt was like a guy that just was like in the mix. So Ian brought Escape to my house to sing Happy Birthday. The interesting thing about Escape is that when they came to my house to sing Happy Birthday, I told them right on the spot that I was going to sign them to my label, which I didn't even have a label. I didn't even have a label. I just was like, I'm going to sign y'all. I'm going to sign y'all. I didn't know many artists. I couldn't go out many places. I wasn't old enough to go to clubs. So basically, I was dealing with things that I I knew Escape was the group that I told I was gonna sign, so then I went back to them and I was like, I'm gonna sign y'all. I, I, I wanted to move with Escape from Criss Cross because I was nervous about me creating another rap project and it not being as successful as Criss Cross and knowing how quick that could have ended my career. So I decided to jump rails and make an R&B group and jump into the R&B world as well because I also wanted to be a producer that showed this this range. I wanted people to see that I wasn't just a, a rap producer. I had the energy in me to make R&B music as well. So So Death became a record label once Criss Cross became the big stars that they were. Criss Cross was so big at, and my mindset was just like, I want, you know, I want this. And I and you know, I was also fueled by the Russell Simmons of the world, the Rick Rubens, the, all of these guys, the Barry Gordy's, all of these people that I felt like I was trying to chase and do what they was doing. So my focus was just like, you know, how how do you how could you beat them? How could you catch them if you don't like completely just lock in? I got a call from Criss Cross and they was on tour and they called me from Chicago. It was like, yo. We met this female rapper, she hard, you should check out. And I was like, I'm cool, I'm not, even, I'm not trying to do no female rap. And at the time, female rappers were the last on the totem pole in hip hop. But Chris and Chris, they vouched for her, and they were saying like, JD, you should really, really check her out. I didn't know what to do with a female rapper. I actually didn't even want a female rapper when I got the brat. So 
I think I procrastinated a couple of times with her, didn't want to meet with her, because I was actually nervous about it. I didn't know what I could do with a female rapper. And then she figured out a way to get to Atlanta, called me, when I went and picked her up, I stopped to get gas or something like that. And when I left her in the car, she put a CD in my CD player. So when I jumped back in the car and I turned the music up, it was her playing. And I was like, what the hell is this? And she's like, this me. You know, at that point, I was almost lost in the sauce of like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, you, yeah, you hard. Okay, I see what's going on. You do sound fly. And my whole mindset is that finding an artist that sparks other people's attention and gets other people talking is usually an artist that I gravitate towards. I was listening to that, that energy. The frequency they, they was giving me made me really, really want to see what I could do with the Brat. But Brat's project actually was one of the hardest projects I ever did in my whole career. My memory of making Brat's record was just like, make a song, throw it away, make a song, throw it away, make a song. Oh, I think I got it, play it. Don't play it for people, but just play it around people and nobody was reacting. And I'm like, damn. Okay, throw that away. Come back, write a different type of style. You know, write another song, write a different type of style. I think we probably wrote 50 songs before we even got to Functify. Kept trying so many things and I just couldn't, I couldn't find what I thought was gonna spark her career in the right way. And then we just started playing around one day with the Functify beat and I started rapping and then she started rapping and she was like, we should do it like this. I'm like, do it like what? And she was like, you should rap. So we had this conversation about it. And then Funkify just came to life like that. And then that was like my first, the first in the industry and in the world actually seeing Jermaine Dupri rap as well. Always Be My Baby was an interesting record because it was the first time I ever worked with Mariah. But I did a whole week with her. And it was crazy because at the time, Mariah Carey was, and still is, you know, by far one of the biggest stars walking this earth. So for her to want to work with me, it was like a oh shit moment. Like, like a, oh, I made it type of moment. But then also it was like a oh shit moment. Like I'm scared. <laughs> like now I'm getting ready to be tested if, to see if I'm really good. What's weird about Usher for me is that I had never done any male R&B records ever <laughs> when I did Usher. So I, it was like I was just shooting from the hip. I didn't actually know what I was doing. When I did a remix of Think of You, I called Usher in to recut the bridge on the song because I wanted it to be something a little bit different than original. And, you know, just to play different because that's what I was working on. I was we're always trying to do something a little different with my remixes. So this was a remix and I had Usher come to my house and sing. And the way I had him sing the bridge, everybody was like, what did you do? What did you get him to do? How did you get him to do this? His voice changed, but you got him sounding amazing, da 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 and I was just like, I don't know. I don't know anything about all the other stuff y'all talking about. I just know what I asked him to do and he did it. And at that point, I feel like they saw this connection between Jermaine Dupri and Usher. His next album was actually put in my hands, which became My Way. She likes it my way. And that was the beginning of me and Usher working together. I think the keys to a hit record to me is it depends on the artist. If you're dealing with an artist that's vocally like with Mariah on We Belong Together, I told her that, you know, you gotta hit the high note. You gotta do, you gotta sing this record. Like, cause it was this thing that Mariah was doing when she was doing a, a softer voice and I was just like, yo, you gotta sing this song full voice. And I knew that's what the people wanted. 
paying attention to me is the is the main ingredient to making a hit record if you pay attention to what the fans like and you pay attention to who the artist is and you try to at least try to make everyone happy and by doing little pieces of things that could possibly go towards the things that people are looking for that seemed to work every time for me brat jagged edge bow wow Anthony Hamilton, Bone Crusher, Young Bloods, Jaquan, them franchise boys. It makes me feel accomplished, you know. But I mean, you know, at the same time, I also know how hard I work to be a part of these projects, how hard I work on trying to make sure that the records sound amazing, how hard I know that the critics are if they records don't work. I don't even celebrate my success because I'm so locked into what I have to do to get to the next success and for this to continue to keep going that I never really get an opportunity really, really to actually celebrate it. I don't believe I'm the greatest. I'm different though. I will say that I'm definitely different than, than most, most of them. Getting inducted to the Songwriters Hall of Fame was almost like a breaking of a glass that I feel like I have been like locked in. And only for me mentally, because I was in a space where I actually write full songs. Like, you know, if like I could write 100% of a whole song and these songs be number one. And they viewed me as a producer and they didn't know that I was actually writing lyrics. At some point I was just like, damn, it's crazy that people don't really like pay attention to the fact that I'd be writing these songs like this. So. When I got inducted to the Songwriters Hall of Fame, this was me being in a room full of people that was thinking the same way I was thinking and that felt the same way I felt. At that point, the glass broke for me and it was like, wow, I'm in a room full of my real peers. These are the people that I need to be around. And then I started realizing for the whole time period of music, for the last 40 years, the music business had never seen another Jermaine Dupri, because where I differ from the people that was inducted prior was like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Babyface, even Barry Gordy. They was writing all songs. They was writing all like R&B records and pop records. None of them had ever written a rap song, right? So for me to get in there, the way that I went in, it was just, I realized what my talent was at that particular moment. I didn't really ever pay attention to the fact that Criss Cross was a number one rap song, and then you wrote an Escape record, and that was a number one R&B record. Then you came back and you wrote Brat Functified, which was another rap song, and then you came back and you wrote Ushers, Nice and Slow, and You Make Me Wonder, which was another R number one. So I kept doing it both sides. I mean, you know, Teddy Riley's my idol, so I'll never think I'm better than him. And Quincy Jones is the greatest producer that walk on this earth. But I do know that I'm different, that's all. What's happening now? We in the ATL, right? If we the ATL, put your A's in the air one time. I understand the, the space that I'm in. Atlanta, you know, one of the things that people don't talk about with me is that when, when, once I created So So Deaf as a label, at the beginning of people trying to come to Atlanta and do interviews, no outlets would come to Atlanta. It was no outlets, Billboard, any of these musical outlets that I wanted to come to Atlanta to do something on my artist, I would physically have to pay for it out of my pocket. The outlets wouldn't come like you guys are here today. I would have had to pay for this back then because Atlanta just wasn't buzzing like that and nobody felt like coming to Atlanta was that important. So I basically live with all of that energy. So when people say they don't believe that my music is up to par to go against anybody, I understand where it's coming from. It doesn't scare me, it doesn't discourage me. I understand where it comes from. Like Atlanta in the hip hop world has been downplayed since the beginning. Majority of the publications and things that print and get the word out to everybody is predominantly in New York, or it was. And if it's not, it's in LA. So it still makes it, it still keeps us from being the main source. A lot of this stuff would be different. Like a lot of people would be like, damn, Jermaine actually created this, or Jermaine actually started this. Like, say for instance, like Criss Cross. I've been telling people this every day. If you look at that Criss Cross post up there, Criss Cross has on jerseys. 
This was in 1992. Nobody in hip hop, you can't think of nobody else in hip hop in 92 that was wearing baseball jerseys. So that means that after 1992, wearing baseball jerseys, football jerseys, basketball jerseys, all of that came from me and Criss Cross. But the industry that we're in, they don't actually frame it up like that. We don't get the credit that we're supposed to, and that's what that's kind of what Andre 3000 was saying at the Source Awards when he said the South got something to say. He felt that same energy that night. I've been feeling that same energy my whole life. The blueprint for my success is focus, you know, not to lose focus, understanding the dynamic of like having to work extra hard to get people to pay attention to my artists. Every song that I write, it has to be a hit or the people, <laughs> uh, people start to tear me down. Living with that type of fire on your back, it's like you can't do anything but stay focused. You know, if you lose focus, you lose in the game. What's next for me is just to really do this at a, the, the, the highest level that I can continue to keep doing it at. Um, because if I, if I do that, I definitely become the producer that nobody else has ever seen. I believe that you have never seen a producer go this long, this hard, ever. And that's my goal is to just <laughs> go as long as I can go for as hard as I can go and, and put myself in a space that is way away from people so that the conversation will be like, well, I don't know anybody else that's had this long of a career. At this height, that's something I want to be able to talk about. <laughs>